future reference um, and put up on our website later. Um, so uh, yes, this is, this talk and this series is in lieu of our joint 21, 2021 conference with uh, Historic Places Aotearoa and Ikemos New Zealand. So under normal circumstances, our speakers would be in front of a wonderful group of uh, wonderful group of heritage advocates uh, discussing these various topics in person. Uh, but since we've been stymied in delivering this in person again, we've reorganized our speakers to present in this webinar format. Also hoping that it may extend beyond our memberships and engage others into understanding and ideally becoming supporters of our cultural heritage. Uh, uh, beyond, beyond this and in its many formats. Um, so before I introduce our first presenter, I'd like to extend uh, a most warm and heartful thanks to James Blackburn, who's our president of our Historic Places Aotearoa, and Mary O'Keefe from ICOMOS New Zealand for their commitment and stamina in firstly trying to organise the joint conference, but then having to reorganise it in this format. So thank you both. And I think everyone shares in that thanks. So today, our first speaker of our series is uh, Moira Smith, Director of the Heritage Practice based in Wellington, and Jim Gardner of GJM Heritage based in Melbourne. Uh, uh, these two were engaged by ICOMOS New Zealand uh, to complete a scoping exercise to analyse the context for creating uh, practice notes to accompany the ICOMOS New Zealand Charter which was funded by the Ministry of Culture and Heritage Capability Fund. Uh, ICOMOS New Zealand's charter is widely used as an industry and state of practice for the care of cultural heritage across New Zealand. It was created in 1993 and revised in 2010. Moira and, and Jim are here to discuss the key issues on the use of the charter in Aotearoa New Zealand including examples of misunderstandings or misrepresentation of the Charter uh, and the inconsistent use of the Charter and resource management decision making, including hearings. It will also consider the project methodology, the report findings and recommendations, and will discuss the priorities for the production of practice notes uh, by ICOMOS New Zealand. So with that, I will pass you on to Moira and Jim. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, thanks, Pam, for that. Can, Pam, can you see the, the, the slides? Oh, My green the slides. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, so um, just starting off with this presentation, um, just to say that I'm a very visual person. And so the uh, slides have a lot of content on them for you to look at while I'm talking because I, I find that helps me to kind of concentrate as somebody else is talking. So I'm, I'm probably not going to read all the content on the slides. So if you want to be reading it while I'm talking, that's absolutely fine. Um, thank you to ICOMOS New Zealand and to Mary for asking us to be the first presenters in this series of lunchtime talks. Um, both Jim and I were, are both trained in architecture, um, both here in, in the architecture school in Wellington uh, we both worked in London at the same time for a while, and then we both moved back to the Southern Hemisphere at about the right same time. So Jim moved to Melbourne, and we moved back to Wellington. Um, when ICOMOS New Zealand um, uh, put forward a request for price for the uh, charter practice notes, uh, Jim and I put together a joint bid uh, because we felt that the two practices could uh, provide a good coverage of both what was happening in New Zealand and probably the wider view of what was happening overseas and some of the best practice that's happening in Melbourne and some of the work that we'd seen in the, in the UK. Oops. Um, so the, the project started when ICOMOS New Zealand applied for grant funding from the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. The initial application was for a seed fund that offered for up to $20,000 and the recipients of the seed funding are expected to apply for project funding for up to $400,000 later this year. Um, so ICMA sent out the request for, request for price. Sorry, my voice is uh, getting tangled up here. Um, 
and we put in our bid for the scoping report. Uh, the first thing that we did was to spend quite a long time proposing and reviewing and refining the problem definition. So you can see from the slide, uh, there's a problem. Uh, the, the, the key issues that came to light really, really quickly were the past misunderstandings and misrepresentations of the charter. And this was something that had been identified by ECOMOS New Zealand when they put forward their uh, grant funding application. ECOMOS had also identified inconsistent use of the charter in resource consent, resource management decision making. And this has particularly come out in the commissioners' hearings for some major projects. And there had been a little, um, a first attempt at uh, looking at case law. And the, the case law is, you know, the, the, case, the case law and the commissioners' hearings had, had really, the, the, the background information had been brought together by Mary O'Keefe. She had gone around a lot of ECOMOS members and they had identified the um, commissioner's hearings where they felt that the commissioner hadn't understood what the charter was about or where the expert witnesses had relied on the charter in some unusual ways. Uh, and I think, I think that quite a lot of us have, have found that, those of the, us who work within the resource management context in New Zealand find that. Um, find that's part of the issue of, of the use of the charter. Um, the other key thing that we identified is that ECOMOS has quite a, quite a lot of uh, really good aims as an organization. And if ECOMOS New Zealand is going to produce practice notes, then actually it has to look at its own aims when it makes those practice notes. Then we looked at the other issues around the production of practice notes, which are not really solvable. So uh, in this slide, we've got Bob the Builder asking, can we fix it? Uh, the answer is probably not for some of these issues. So, so what we have underlying in New Zealand is um, a, quite a complex underlying legislation, particularly between the Resource Management Act and the Heritage New Zealand Puheri Tonga Act. Um, we don't have a consistent national statutory framework. For example, we don't have um, a national planning standard for heritage. And what it means at a practical level is that every single council in New Zealand, when they are writing um, a heritage inventory, has a different set of, uh, of heritage criteria and thresholds for just, just to use to identify heritage. Um, and every single um, district plan at the moment is written um, is written from first principles. We've got the national planning standards coming through that will help regularize that. But really we do have a really inconsistent uh, national fra statutory framework. And basically ICOMOS writing practice notes probably isn't gonna solve that. Um, one of the, another key issue is the lack of mandatory inclusion for um, uh, charter, for use of the charter within the district and regional plans. And, and there's a, 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 a huge lack of resources for heritage management in New Zealand. For example, the Heritage New Zealand um, uh, Sustainable Management Series that was written in 2007 and hasn't been updated since then. And you know, some of the key base legislation has changed since then, particularly their own legislation, the, the Heritage New Zealand Prohibited Tongue Act has changed since then. Uh, so then, in terms of the report, we, we pulled together all of these key ideas, the, the things that we could address during the, with the practice notes, and the things that are out of our control, but are still create the, the background and basis to what we were doing. Uh, and then we put them together with pretty colours, because I think that always helps when you're writing a report. Jim, do you want to pick up on the literature review? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Moira. And um, hello, everybody from Melbourne, Australia. Um, look, uh, one of the things which really appealed to me about this project was um, looking more broadly at how these issues are treated, um, not just in New Zealand or even Australia, but 
um, more generally. I will start, however, I think without the risk of perhaps channeling um, Amanda Mulligan and say, well, this is how we do it in Australia. And I might just contrast a couple of the points Moira's already um, made. And obviously Australia has a three-tier government system with the federal, state, and then local government. But even though we have arguably a more complex government structure, we have probably a greater degree of harmonization of some of these matters um, across the country. So for instance, um, there is a single um, set of criteria, which is largely drawn from the borough charter values, but that criteria is used in slightly modified forms across the federal government for the Commonwealth and national heritage lists, um, the eight state and territory governments, and the several hundred local planning authorities. So one advantage we do have is that common set of criteria, which is at least in part derived from the values identified in the borough charter. And I'm sure you're aware of the borough charter, which was in some ways a progenitor to the um, ICOMOS New Zealand charter. Um, there are, however, some similarities, um, major similarities in how we, uh, the problems we have with the application of the borough charter here. And that is the weight given to it in um, hearings for environment court, for tribunals, for planning panels and other jurisdictions. And I think like the experience um, Moira um, and Pam and others have spoken about is how that, that differs dramatically from expert to expert or from barrister to barrister when arguing a matter before um, those, um, those bodies. Um, one of the things that um, we do have perhaps an advantage over is too, is that the state level takes a much more active role in local planning than the central government in New Zealand. So for instance, in Victoria, there is a single format planning scheme, which is used across all 79 local planning authorities. That is effectively provided by the state government planning department um, and in consultation with local governments, but it embeds as part of the state heritage policy um, reference to the borough charter. So all councils have to have some regard to it in, um, their, in the state policy, which then um, is automatically forms part of all local policies. So we have, that's some of the lessons I think which are useful from the Australian situation. Um, I think the common criteria based on charter values is critical and also then having that hook into um, you know um, district plans, local policies is also something that perhaps we're uh, a little bit further advanced on but I think could easily be translated into New Zealand um, if there was the option for a national planning standard for heritage, for instance. Um, but what I'll first talk about is the literature review. Um, the, the brief contained, um, and sort of no offence to the writers of the brief, but a bit of a grab bag of issues, some of which might be considered um, practice notes, but some of which were a wish, wish list of, of other issues which are pertinent or um, current um, today. So um, we started off by looking at those lists. The aim of the literature review was not just to provide a foundation for the survey work and the recommendations, but also to provide a standalone and hopefully useful um, resource. Now I understand hopefully that document is available. It's got hot links throughout to various guidance, um, but we looked at those research um, topics, we looked at how charters were integrated into legislation and regulation um, elsewhere. Um, obviously, a starting point coming from the Australian situation was how the borough charter is used and then the series of practice notes which have been in existence for um, uh, a number of more than 10 years now. Um, which cover particular articles and issues associated with the application of the charter. Um, then there are 
um, the the various there's a toolkit of sort of more useful information which um, is um, aligned to the borough charter and then there's all the other guidance so what we did we looked at um, Australia we looked at each state and territory we looked primarily at English speaking countries for both practicality and the scope available so we looked at um, um, Canada um, particularly Parks Canada's work some of the work from um, Quebec um, the um, US we looked at the US um, department uh, secretary for the interiors um, uh, standards and also particularly California because of the um, earthquake provisions that has an earthquake and seismic strengthening was one of the issues that had been identified, albeit it's probably not a practice note issue. Um, and then um, from the UK, um, uh, English Heritage and um, Historic England and Historic Scotland. So we, it, so it is very um, uh, the Anglosphere centric, the, the review we did. Um, but we tried to look at a mixture of both um, uh, central government and then state or provincial government level um, guidance. We also looked at um, the various other um, ICOMOS charters that are available on the basis of no point in reinventing the wheel. And um, for instance, the practice notes for the borough charter cross reference frequently um, to other ICOMOS um, um, charters and guidance, and then other NGOs like the um, Getty Institute. So hopefully um, you're, um, you have access to the literature review because we intend it to be you know, a useful tool and something that can be um, updated. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Moira? Um, one of the things that um, certainly um, came out of the literature search and indeed the list of topics that um, uh, New Zealand ICOMOS provided was that um, there was some definitional issues on what is um, a practice note. Um, and what so what we looked at was um, trying to group these topics and the um, guidance that flowed from them that we found through the literature search into some um, useful um, categories. And so we looked at really practice notes, um, um, both in a definitional sense, as shown on the screen, but also in how they're used in other um, sectors and jurisdictions. And practice notes are commonly used within the court system by um, some territorial authorities, by professional organisations like the NZIA and Engineering New Zealand. Um, they're used, as I say, with the borough charter and those practice notes used by the in the borough charter and in terms of um, certainly the um, the court systems and the tribunals and legislative systems I deal with in Australia is they are all about um, telling how you um, operate within that um, that court system or that jurisdiction or how you apply to assist in the application of. Um, a charter, whether it's the New Zealand charter or the borough charter. So they are really tied very directly to the practice of um, that um, of that jurisdiction, that court system, um, or um, how you apply um, or implement um, the um, the charter. So it's not um, so. For instance, I wouldn't expect within a practice note to have detailed guidance on seismic strengthening or lime mortars or um, universal access. A practice note we see is how you apply the articles, for instance, of the New Zealand Charter and guidance on how you might, for instance, incorporate the New Zealand Charter within a, um, a district plan or other statutory um, planning instrument. Um, so a lot of what um, was on the topics probably fell into the categories of heritage policy and technical guidance. And we split these two up because heritage policy we see is primarily is um, the guidance that's provided to help decision makers 
Um, so that's local councils. Um, you don't have a minister for planning or minister for heritage, but um, decision makers um, uh, who are exercising discretion under a district plan or legislation and making a decision. So that might be, um, you know, um, policies around um, uh, the um, provision of universal access or, or policies around considering um, uh, adaptive reuse so that people in making their, um, their statutory decisions have a basis for doing so and applicants and building owners or heritage place owners um, have an understanding of what matters are going to be taken into consideration in terms of say demolition or whatever so that's about um so we saw that a lot of the issues um, identified in the topics were fitted better into heritage policy and then the final category was the technical guidance so this is you know everything from um you know lime mortars to um uh, seismic strengthening to undertaking um, timber repairs. So the, the technical guidance that you might refer to, um, provide to contractors. Um, and so we saw that these are all quite different, discrete um, products. And that the ICOMOS New Zealand Charter can't do everything in this space. And that the focus really for ICOMOS and its priority is probably in the use of the charter, um, the integration of the charter into um, practice um, and the interpretation of the charter. And other things like heritage policy might be more a matter for um, a local planning authority or for um, Heritage New Zealand. And likewise, technical guidance may be something that is provided by the uh, Engineering New Zealand in terms of seismic strengthening or by um, uh, it might be developed by a, a university or by another um, body might be ultimately um, uh, endorsed by ICOMOS but it's probably not a practice note that's informing the use of the charter. Um, so that, that was that all this was all the work which was done prior to the uh, this online survey which um, Moira will take us to um, and that was to really give us a really good foundation for what is a practice note what's out there at the moment and what how are these other topics handled beyond practice notes through policy and technical guidance so Moira I'll hand back to you Do you know I was on mute all that time? So once, thanks to Jim for that. So so once we'd, we'd um, worked out what a practice note actually was, once we'd done the literature review, and once we'd looked at the problem definition, then we went out and did some consultation. And the consultation wasn't just on the list of, uh, the initial list of 18 topics that we'd been given by ECOMOS New Zealand, but we also wanted to unpack some of those other big issues that we identified at the beginning of the presentation. So we didn't know who used the charter. We didn't know how they used the charter. We didn't know what type of work they used it for. And we didn't know if they, how easy the charter was to use, how ambiguous it was in its interpretation. Uh, and finally, we wanted to know what people thought of the topics. Uh, so the survey it has quite a small, um, small group of people who answered it, but has a lot of really good information in it and was a really, really useful tool, I thought. So just because SurveyMonkey is an amazing tool and gave us a lot of slides for free, I'm just going to quickly flip you through some of the answers. So... Um, who are you and where and where have you worked? So this is uh, a question for people about all of their careers. You can see that most people do or have worked in consultancy uh, of the people who answered the, the, the survey. And the second largest group are people who work for local government or have worked for local government, like quite a lot of us. 
And the third largest group was um, people who worked for national government, and that included people who worked for Heritage New Zealand. Uh, we also were curious to know about people who worked in um, glam organisations, students, uh, developers and people who owned buildings, uh, people who worked for iwi, hapu and Fano uh, organisations, uh, and property managers and owners. And you can see they all come out quite low in, in the numbers, but were still provided us with quite interesting um, data. Uh, what do you use the charter for? Uh, we used it, uh, most people use it for conservation managing, management and planning and recording. For example, for um, writing a conservation plan. Uh, a lot of people used it for built heritage, no surprises there. A lot of people used it for resource consent applications, advocacy, uh, and then dropping down to the bottom, very few people use it for natural values. Very, people, very few people use it for the marine and coastal environment. Um, and again, this is the kind of information that we were expecting to see. So it was nice when it landed where we thought it would. This one was quite sweet because uh, we wanted to know how easy it was for the, for the professionals who use the charter to use it. Uh, and the professional said it was quite easy. I think this question would be really useful to take out to people who don't use the charter so much. Um, and see how easy it is for the non-experts to use it. But, but for our small group of people, uh, it was useful to know that, that, that they found it quite easy. And then the last slide I'm gonna show you is people ranking the, the proposed topics in the order that they'd like to see them published. And this was a fascinating, um, a fascinating list to watch order and reorder itself as the survey was live. So you'd have five, five people would give you their information that they, they'd submit their survey, and it would actually be in quite a different order. Then the next five would submit their, their survey um, data and the, the whole thing would kind of reorder itself. And at one point we were looking each, at each other going, oh, well, there's no priority. There's the, everything's equal. We, can, we don't understand it. But by the time that everybody had answered the survey, we started to see a clear priority order. And no real surprise is that the charter and overview is the absolute priority for everybody. Um, and then the next five are looking at the, the, the back end of the charter and unpacking the degrees of intervention from preservation to adaptation, uh, understanding and assessing cultural heritage value. Uh, the next one, number four, was the use of the charter and hearings. And again, looking at the little, the, the very, very light, very, very early case study analysis that we've done earlier on in the literature review, it's actually no surprise that the use of the charter and he hearings came so high up in people's priorities. Um, it was also really interesting to see how people wanted the chart to, to, to unpack the charter and the management of Maori heritage. And what's really interesting about this particular topic is the split between people who are expert in that field, who felt that um, there is a lot of work that would need to be done to unpack this topic um, and who were quite cautious about how you'd approach it through to the people who were less expert, who just weren't, just really, really needed some guidance. Um, so for that one, the, the, the individual responses on why people thought that was important are, are really interesting. And that kind of data that we've got out of the survey has been put together in the, uh, in, into the report so that the person who is writing who will write this charter practice note actually has a lot of information to use later on. So they'll have the New Zealand literature review, they'll have the case study, the, 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 the case law analysis, they'll have the survey respondents um, and they'll have the international literature, literature review. And so there is actually quite a good starting point for a lot of these practice notes based on the information that we've gathered, gathered in the report. 
Uh, Jim, would you like to talk a little bit about the um, what an ECOMOS New Zealand practice note might look like? Yep, sure. Thank you. And I think just to follow on from that last slide, I think it was very positive to see that the original problem definition um, and the actual purpose of the project from ECOMOS, the need for it was borne out in that survey and that those highest priority areas were about how the ECOMOS New Zealand Charter um, is used, how it is um, implemented. But as you could see from that last slide, there was a relatively um, flat tail to the um, priorities of the other topics, which as I say, were a, arguably a mixture of things that uh, might be practice notes and might not be. Um, so the what we um, then looked at is really what might, um, uh, how we could um, prioritize um, a practice note and um, more will come to a flow chart, simple flow chart on that um, shortly. But there were some, um, some basic tests that we, um, we were looking at on in terms of a, a practice note, like um, is it going to help in the application use and interpretation of the um, ICOMOS New Zealand Charter? And to be a practice note, um, it's our view that though that box um, must be ticked. Um, is it something that um, is a priority for um, ICOMOS New Zealand and heritage practice more um, generally. And I think that's the survey really will help inform that, but you know, the use of the charter, um, the, um, the use of the charter in um, Maori heritage, the, um, the applicator or the way the charter is interpreted by um, the courts and um, in by the statutory decision makers um, are all really um, meaty good topics that um, can flow from that. Um, we also looked at though, um, should ECOMOS New Zealand be developing this information? So unless there was this close nexus between um, what the practice, uh, heritage practice in New Zealand required and the role of ECOMOS, it might be that it's something for another organisation. Um, and we also looked at um, obviously not wanting to reinvent the wheel. So where there has been um, other um, ICOMOS publications to draw on those, to use the, um, I think the, the format for the, um, the borough charter um, practice notes is relatively simple. They're not long documents, as little as three pages long. Um, so that they, so there are models that, um, can be used. So we're really looking at focusing on um, what are the priorities, making sure it's delivering um, information on um, the practice use and interpretation of the charter, and then linking in and tying to um, other publications. Um, the um, other topics uh, I think are are interesting because there's a number of topics which are obviously of genuine interest to heritage practitioners in New Zealand, and there is certainly a nexus with um, ECOMOS New Zealand's work, but fall outside that practice note. And it's in those instances where um, partnerships may be of value, um, whether it's with Heritage New Zealand, one of the professional bodies, the NZIA or um, Engineering New Zealand, um, or the university sector, and where ECOMOS can leverage its mana and its status to um, endorse or to um, disseminate some of that work without having to resource it um, itself. Um, but Moira, I think I might we might move to your um, uh, very attractive flow chart, which helps us decide whether it's a, um, a practice note and whether it's a high priority practice note or not. Cool. So, so the first question was just looking quickly back at that last slide is, you know, does it talk about the charter? Does it talk about another ICOMOS charter internationally? And does it help guide professional practice? And if it doesn't do those three things, um, then it's not, um, it's not an ICOMOS New Zealand practice note. So the first question that the flowchart asks uh, is, does the topic support the aims of ICOMOS New Zealand? 
And if, and if the topic doesn't do that, then don't produce the practice note. Um, we are, we are, a, a, we are a um, professional organization with very limited funds and we really need to stick to our knitting and let others do their knitting. Uh, the, second, um, the second question was, does the topic address the purpose of the Nicomos New Zealand practice note? That was the little slide that we had previously. Um, and is it been identified as important in the consultation? So if a topic, uh, if a topic isn't, isn't, doesn't fit that previous slide, which I might just flick back to. So if a topic doesn't, um, isn't about the use or interpretation of the ECOMOS Charter or about another ECOMOS publication and doesn't support professional practice in New Zealand, then it's not a practice note but it may have also been identified as important in the consultation. And in that case, then you consider other ways of providing the guidance, either by nudging Heritage New Zealand and trying to get, trying to get them to update their sustainable guidance series, or by looking in the literature review and starting a toolbox uh, topic based on all of the fabulous literature that we've already found from overseas, or or by finding some other way of, of creating that, that guidance, but it's not a practice note. Um, if it meets all of the things in that central box, but the consultation didn't find it to be particularly important, then it's a low priority for commissioning the report. Um, but ICOMOS could still consider producing that practice note. If, for example, an expert member within the organization got very flat fired up, and volunteered to create the practice node. So it would be a low, in those circumstances, it would meet, it would support the aims of ECMOS New Zealand. Um, it would meet the purpose of the practice note, but it would be a low priority. Um, it's a low priority for commissioning or paying for a report, but there may be other ways of, of making those ones appear. Then for the ones where it does actually meet each of these three criteria, it's important, it's a practice note and, and it's something that ECOMOS New Zealand is part of the core uh, part of why ECOMOS New Zealand exists. Then um, the next question is, is it relevant to another organization? And the reason why we've asked that is that there's a lot of membership organizations out there who have more members than we do and have more resources than we do. And if we can co-produce a publication with, for example, the NZAA, then we're looking at being able to get that practice note in front of four and a half thousand people rather than in front of 200 people. Um, and we could, if we can get another organization to endorse it, then it will become much more widely used within New Zealand. Um, another example is Engineering New Zealand. I think they've got closer to 20,000 members and they actively work with other organizations to co-produce practice notes. Um, so looking for those opportunities to work with bigger organizations and co-produce and endorse things means that um, we can get uh, more for our money, uh, we can get better uptake on who uses the practice notes, um, and, and it seems like a very efficient way of, of working. So the question is, is it relevant to another organization? then we can consider producing a joint practice note or publication. If it's not relevant to another organization, but it's still a high priority, then ECOMOS New Zealand could look at, um, at commissioning that, uh, commissioning the production of those ones. And so really it is just a little bit of a, um, you know, a sheepyard. You put your topic at the beginning of this uh, series of questions and at the end of it, it will pop out in one of the, the various boxes. So we then put the, the topics that had been identified by ECOMOS at the beginning of the, um, of the work program, plus anything interesting that had popped up during the survey. And what we got out at the end of it was that the, uh, the, the, the charter and over, overview is the absolute first priority for ECOMOS to produce. Uh, and the second group of high priorities are degrees of intervention, understanding and assessing cultural heritage value, the use of the charter in resource consent, resource management decision-making, the charter in Māori heritage uh, and climate change and 
adapt mitigation and adaptation. So again, these are the ones, these are the highest priorities for commissioning and paying for the production of practice notes. But the other really nice thing that came out of the survey was that we were then able to break out into some focus groups, which actually ended up being mainly one-to-one -one conversations with people and a number of extremely well qualified ICOMOS New Zealand members put their hands up to write practice notes at no cost to the organisation. And those are also a priority, I, we, we think a priority for the organisation. So the overall recommendations for the preparation of ICOMOS New Zealand practice notes um, were, we, we felt, we're, we need to deliver on the aims of ICOMOS New Zealand and we, we need to have those aims right at the front of what we're doing all of the time because that's the core of what the organisation is it, it does and there's no other organisation that has the, the um, remit to do this work. We have to focus on the charter. We should be creating using the work to create partnerships with other organisations for those reasons that we gave before, for the reach, for the spread, um, so that more people use the practice notes, so that we produce practice notes um, efficiently in terms of time and money. We, we should have a use a standard template. That's what the borough chartered practice notes are set out in. Then you always know what part of the practice note to get the information out that, that you need. We need to consider these as enduring documents. Um, the Borough Charter practice notes stand there for 10 years before they get updated. If you look at the Engineering New Zealand practice notes, th there's a range of times when these were written. Uh, if you look at the NZIA practice notes, the, the, the practice notes get written and then they get left for years or decades before they get updated. So we have to consider when we write a practice note that it may be there 10 years later. Um, we, we need to be really cognizant that we are using limited resources. Even if we do, even if we are successful in getting the next grant of, out of MCH, we have a limited pool of money that we can call on. To, to make the best use of limited resources, we have to establish what's needed. And we need to do that through consultation, which is what we've done. Uh, but also once we start producing the drafts of the practice notes, we need to be really consultative on the way that we produce them. And if you look at ICOMOS, uh, Australia ICOMOS, when they produced their borough charter practice notes, these were circulated around interest groups, um, non-Australia ICOMOS groups, um, government, you know, non-governmental uh, heritage agencies and around the government so that there was a huge buy-in to what was actually produced at the end of the day. And then the final final slide um, is the actions that, that we have recommended that come out at the end of the report. So obviously the first one was to, to circulate the report to the board. Uh, the, the next was to create an enduring program to produce and review practice notes. Like I said before, once you put these practice notes up, up into the world, then you need to see them as enduring documents, but you also have to commit to a regular review so that they, that they stay up to date. Um, the next action was to seek funding for the highest priority topics. And actually that should be the six highest priority topics because, um, because I can't count. Um, the next uh, action was to support those members who have offered to write other practice notes. And the next action is to seek opportunities to co-produce practice notes. We should be commissioning these practice notes in batches because of that consultation that we were talking about before. We can't weary our members by going through consultation after consultation. We should be asking people to, to review um, things in, in short sets so that we aren't continuously asking people for their feedback. Uh, but again, we should also be actively consulting on these. Uh, we should also put these on our website because that's where everyone's going to look for them. Then for all of the other information that we were talking about before, so Jim was talking about those two other sets of um, guidance, the, the uh, policies for what you might do at a place, 
and the actual kind of technical guidance about lime mortars and when to use helix. There's a lot of information out there. We've found a lot of that in the um, literature review. We really should be considering having a toolbox um, like the Australia ECOMOS website has that pulls together all of the best practice guidance for a topic in one place. And you can flick onto their website and go, wildfires, right. Here's the five best things on wildfires that we've got. And then the final, final um, action, which is a little bit controversial, but the ECOMOS New Zealand Charter is 10 years old. Well, actually 12 years old because I can't count. Um, but if it's under consideration for review, then this should happen either before we start writing these practice notes or happen in parallel. And so with the borough charter, when they did their borough charter practice note review, they were also reviewing the borough charter at the same time. And, and that helped them to also be able to do their active consultation on the borough charter update, plus on the practice notes at the same time. Jim, do you have any last comments to make? Um, no, other than I think um, this is an extremely valuable um, exercise. Um, it, was great from my point of view to just look more broadly than Australia and New Zealand um, practice. And that I certainly encourage ECOMOS New Zealand to continue on this path. And especially as the, um, you know, there are um, issues about the application of the New Zealand Charter, which is a fantastic document. I've used it myself um, on projects in New Zealand. Um, and getting it more widely disseminated and better understood by um, decision makers and experts. Um, so I really um, commend New Zealand ECOMOS for this project and do hope it gets some central government funding. Okay, well, thank you to you both because that was uh, very, very thorough uh, and we were very pleased to get that report. Um, so, Updates from there then, uh, on the back of what Jim just said, uh, the, the recommendations have been taken on board by the ECOMOS New Zealand board. So we are looking to uh, move on with those as soon as funding's available. Um, we're waiting for the Ministry of Culture and Heritage to release the next uh, funding round so that we can apply for it. They are expecting us to apply for it as well, uh, based on the success of this report. Um, so it's a high chance that we'll actually get further funding to continue the process, which will be really helpful. Um, but it's also really lovely to hear that we've got a set of volunteers that would like to contribute as well. And I think that's what makes what will make it a lot better is that people who are actively in practice will be helping to make the guidelines of all these practice notes. Um, and it means that they're, they're central to the game. They they're involved on a daily basis. So they should be current and they should be practical and useful to everybody in the end. Um, now, I see that we don't have any uh, questions on the old uh, Slido, um, which is fine. Oh, no, we do actually. Um, we do. Where will the literature review be available? It looks valuable. It is indeed valuable. Um, now that we've gone through this process, we will publish it to the ECMOS New Zealand website. Um, the website is uh, uh, constantly um, under a certain guise of um, an IT working group. So we are slowly but surely making progress on making improvements to the website, but that doesn't stop us from updating certain documents. So that will be put up shortly. Um, is the ECOMOS New Zealand Charter under review? And if so, when? Um, we're not quite sure yet because we're probably going to rely heavily on the funding if we get it. So I suspect that we will talk more about um, enveloping it as part of the next funding round if it's going to happen. Uh, will the webinar recording be available for later? Yes, it will, um, but we will probably wait till we've done all of them. Um, so there's five more, I believe, after this, and we will uh, upload them all together for watching later. Um, which practice notes will be prepared by volunteers? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I, I'm not actually sure who the volunteers are at the moment, uh, but I'm sure we'll become privy to them soon when we start to get into them. <laughs>
actually writing them. Uh, but of course, uh, the ECMOS New Zealand structure for committees and working groups is such that any members that would like to participate in working groups are welcome to. If they just want to get in touch with the sec secretariat to uh, let us know of your interest and then we'll put you in touch with the relevant uh, working group or committee chairperson. Um, so our working group uh, chairperson for the ECMOS Charter Guidelines is Mary O'Keefe, uh, and that working group belongs to the Advocacy and Communications Committee, and that's chaired by myself. So you guys can get in touch with us via the Secretariat, and we'd be more than happy, happy to involve you in ongoing meetings and consultation. And of course, that's a chance for you to be involved in the actual writing of it. Um, many hands make like work, so I do encourage it because um, we always love the help. Um, beyond that, and uh, no other direct questions, it appears, for Moira and Jim, uh, I will thank you both for your time and let people get away for their lunch. Thanks again to James and Mary for converting our um, joint conference into this webinar series. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.